Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 347, featuring the final installment of my interview with Mr. Mike Whitwer, the author of Empire of Imagination, a biography of Gary Gygax. This part of the interview, we talk about Gary as a family man. Uh, what was it like uh, uh, growing up with Gary Gygax as your dad? Uh, we look at it from the point of view of his kids for a while. Uh, we also talk about the uh, hard times that he fell on later in his life. I mean, on the one hand, he had a lot of financial success, but on the other hand, a lot of his best friends and uh, loved ones passed away tragically. So uh, we delve into that, and uh, we end by talking about Mike's plans for future books. A lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Mike Whitwer. Of course, you know, the other side to him, as you mentioned a few times, a, a father. Uh, big family, five kids. Huge. <laughs> you know, I was, I was a little shocked to see how it, you know, they had some thinking about how much work that he churned out, you know, and how productive he was, and that you think all these kids would have been a huge uh, sort of hindrance to him, but it's, it sounded like they actually were quite a help to him at, with uh, playtesting the games, and I guess they got involved in the, they ran the store for a while, and were... Oh, yeah, he had everybody involved. I mean, he, he was really quite passionate about his family. You know, it's funny, while Gary, um, I think it's safe to say Gary had some shortcomings about being home because he was so passionate about his gaming so while he wasn't creating games he was playing games I mean the guy was nuts about games but I think he did go to a lot of effort to bring his family in as much as he could Mary Jo his first wife and wanted nothing to do with games um, he brought in his his daughters or I should say his oldest daughter into his early playtesting and then later his other daughters into playtesting and, and other types of gaming uh, they didn't stay with it for the most part but his sons, um, Ernie and Luke in particular, stayed with it very passionately for their whole lives. He had all of his family working at TSR at different times uh, in different capacities. That was something that, you know, so the answer is that I think he did. He really did go to a lot of trouble to bring his family into his business and to his gaming. But it didn't always work out that well. And so the, the answer was at certain times in his life, um, this guy would come home from working his job. His day job through the 60s was he was an insurance underwriter in Chicago so he had an hour and a half commute each way uh, from Lake Geneva to Chicago and back via the train because he never drove a car. He never got a driver's license. And uh, he would get home, you know, and as, as Mary Jo explained to me a few times, you know, that he might sit down at the table. They always sat down. They did have a formal dinner. He might read his mail and then retire to his study the rest of the night, writing out his next move in a play-by-mail game that he was working on at the time or run a game for friends that night of some, of some sort, or work on some variant, or some newsletter for a fanzine or whatever. So um, the answer was it didn't leave a lot of time necessarily to, to do a lot of other family type stuff when he was doing all this. You know, so I, I think Gary did have some regrets uh, late in his life about how much time he spent with his family. But I, can t I could also say absolutely he was passionate about them, and he did really try hard to bring them into some of these these obsessions that he had. I guess that's the right way to put it. They weren't even hobbies for Gary. They were obsessions. Yeah, his daughter, Elise. Is that am I pronouncing her name right? Elise? Yeah. Uh, Elisa, yeah. There's uh, Elisa? A French, uh, yeah, but Elise is correct, yeah. Yeah, her role in this was very interesting because you mentioned that it sounded like, uh, I wasn't quite sure how to picture this, but it sounded like his, the guys, basically the guys that would come over to play at his house would sort of have a crush on, on her. I don't know how old she would have been at this point, but it sounded like that had created some some frictions as well. Yeah, I mean, so she but was. This, uh, but then he had her on the cover of that that advertisement that you show right. in the book. So I'm just like, what's going on with? <laughs> well, so, yeah, so so she's um, she, she was beautiful. I mean, so Gary had beautiful daughters, um, you know, and it's it's not that surprising because his his wife was was gorgeous. Mary Jo was just gorgeous. I, there's a picture of her in, in the book. Um, she was a knockout. She was this red haired knockout. And uh, so he had, he had beautiful daughters. And um, and so, yeah, she's like, I want to say she's 15 or 16 in that in that picture you're talking about where she's in the ad for the uh, the monster manual when they, they put out AD&D. And, and um, you know, she was an aspiring model. She wanted to be a model. So I think she wanted to do that that work. Um, but it's it's really interesting that that all these guys that came along had this big crush on, on Elise. Um, that, that's well known. 
Uh, Dave Arneson had a crush on her. Uh, Rob Koontz had a crush on her. I got the sense um, that many, was one many, of the many, reasons why Gary and Dave Arneson might have uh, clashed, but maybe I'm... You know, you know, it might be. I, I can't say I know that for certain, because I'm not sure to what extent Gary ever knew that Dave had a crush on her, but um, uh, I, I know that, that she was considered someone where they would go over and they would kind of, you know, giggle, and they, they would... Uh, people that would come over had a legitimate crush on her. And, of course, one thing that's notable is that a lot of people that did come over were kind of a, more of a contemporary of her than they were of Gary. In the early days of role-playing, again, it's a very, it's a very disparate group of people where, um, I, you know, it kind of, this says it best, you know, Gary's gaming group in Lake Geneva, when he, uh, just before he starts D&D, it's called the, um, uh, well, the Castle and Crusade Society is what it's called. And the makeup of this group is a couple of 36-year-old guys, Gary and, and his sheet metal worker partner, Don Kay, um, there's, there's like a 30 year old college professor in there. There's a 21 year old college student. There's 14 year old Rob Kuntz and there's uh, like 10 or 11 year old Ernie Gygax. So it's a really big range of a group. And so Gary's gaming groups were always uh, really eclectic groups of people. So a lot of these people that would come by were like basically kids. They were, you know, 18 years old or they were seven. So they were actually sometimes more contemporaries of, of, his, of Gary's kids than of Gary. And so, uh, in a weird sort of way, it made a lot of sense that a lot of these people would come over and they would see Elise, who was really very beautiful, and they were, you know, kind of stricken by her. So that was always a very interesting, um, kind of interesting tale, an interesting thing that came out uh, during those interviews. Yeah, it must have been an interesting discussion the, the day that the, that ad was put out. <laughs> Phil, I'm, I'm get, I get the impression he must not have been one of these sort of overprotective dads. Uh, you know, yes and no. He kind of was, though. I mean, again, like Gary, in a lot of things, I think he was a contradiction in some ways, because I think he was. Yeah, you did have that scene in there with Doctor Love, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that's a hundred percent true story. Where where um, where Elise has this this uh, blind date coming up with this um, with this guy, and so you know, you mentioned Gary being protective and not all at once. So Gary had a very strict curfew for his kids, and this was this was like Elise's first date. So. You know, she's got this blind date coming over. She's, um, I don't know, 14 or 15 years old at the time. And, the, you know, the guy shows up at the door. And he's in this broken down Camaro and he's this greasy kind of rocker type that shows up at the door. You know, and what Gary and Elise have been arguing about before he shows up is that she needs to be in by 930 on the day. I think it was 930. She had to be in. And she's like, come on, Dad, you're being such a square. This is ridiculous. Everyone else gets to stay out late. So the guy shows up and he's a total dud, and Elise is totally not thrilled with this guy. Again, it's a blind date; she doesn't know who he's going out, who she's going out with. So Gary gets a look at him, and you know, and he meets him, and the guy describes himself when you know he says, he says, "Oh, what's your name? What do you do?" And the guy says, hey, "They call me the Doc." And Gary says, "The Doc, <laughs> the Doc of what?" And he says, "Doctor Love," you know, like like the Kiss song. And so Gary kind of chuckles to himself, and he looks at Elise, and he looks at this guy. And so Elise, of course, looks at Gary and says, you know, OK, Dad, well, I guess I got to be in by 930, right? And she kind of it's a <laughs> wink and a nod because now she wants to be in by 930. And that's, of course, classic Gary says, oh, no, no, no. Stay out as late as you want. <laughs> and retires Please. To, his, to his den. You know, but so it, it's funny. So, you know, Gary, I think is that's that's a I, the one reason I put that in there is because that, that's such a great microcosm of Gary's sense of humor of his protectiveness on one side and yet his, his laxness on another. Um, there's so many interesting little tidbits in just that story. And so, you know, one of the first questions you asked me is about the style and about telling it in a very narrative way, almost like it reads like a novel, right? And to me, a story like that tells you so much more about Gary Gygax and recreating the scene is exactly as, as the way it was told. I mean, I, I tried to be as exactly as truthful as I could be. Um, that tells you an awful lot about this guy without having to tell you that, oh, he had this great sense of humor. Oh, he, um, you know, I could tell you that in a non-narrative sort of way, but it, it tells you a lot about him. I guess that's what I'm trying to say is that I think it explains much more than, than many pages of facts and figures could. Yeah, it was the way they might say in a creative writing workshop, you're showing, not telling. There you go. Showing, <laughs> not telling. All right, Mike. So here's just the last question. You know, and again, I appreciate you taking the time to Oh, thank you. Talk about all this stuff. It's quite the story. <laughs> the story about the yeah, it story about the story. Right. Uh, so I was just thinking about this and, you know, as I was reading this book, reading about Gary, sort of the highs and lows. And I mean, there's some pretty powerful. I mean, there's some scenes in there that definitely aren't humorous. I mean, that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll tear up, you know, if you've got any kind of sensitivity reading this, reading this uh, book. No doubt. Uh, but I'm just wondering, you know, just as some as the writer... 
Uh, what part for you would you say was was the most difficult to tackle? What was the most emotional? Oh gosh, part you know, of the book for you. Um, that's a good question. You know, I think there's two parts that stand out to me. Um, and it's funny because it's this is some of the the stuff that a lot of people really didn't know. So. When Gary's mother dies in um, in October 1980, that's a major turning point for Gary. Um, I'll, you know, that's one thing that's not well known is that his mother was a huge force in his life, a point of stability. Um, she really kept them afloat when they were poor. I mean, that's another thing that's not well known is that he was downright dirt poor before DD came out. I mean, he had worked as an underwriter. He was unemployed though for nearly three years. Yeah, that's about right. Uh, for about three years before that game came out, they were on fumes. His mother was one of the people that kept them together. He just he, he adored his mother. Uh, they called her Posey was her was her nickname, and um, and so she dies uh, of a of a heart attack I think in uh, in 1980, and it, even worse, she died in kind of a traumatic way for them. She was actually in the car with them, dying of this heart attack while they're driving her to the hospital. Uh, he and, and Mary Jo. And keep in mind, I, I talked about how he's already dissociated from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, there's a lot of other things that have gone on with Gary in that, in that period of, say, between 75 and 80. We talked about the, the James Dallas Egbert the thing. That was very stressful for Gary and everybody at TSR. So Gary's been through all of this stuff about controversies of the game. Uh, he no longer has a stable congregation supporting him anymore. He no longer has a lot of his earliest friends and supporters. Dave Arneson is gone, long gone. Uh, Dave McGarry is long gone. That's another one of these early important Daves um, that that was very foundational in other ways. Um, a lot of his earliest friends, Tim Kask is now gone. He was the original editor of Dragon Magazine. Um, he was actually TSR employee number one. He's long gone. Uh, not long gone, but but recently gone. So he's at a point of major instability. Then his mother dies, who is his rock. And so Gary falls off a cliff for a while. Gary is a different guy for a while. And I, I remember having that in my mind when I was reading those Dragon magazines from that, that period uh, and moving into the Beverly Hills era and some of these crazier eras of his life, moving from, say, 1980 to 1985. And you can really see it in everything he's doing that Gary is, is wild. Gary's in a very wild part of his life. Um, he gets very fatalistic. He gets very... Um, he, you know, he, he gets into some, some drug use. He gets into a lot of things that are less healthy, but this is a very wild part of his life. Um, and you can really see it in his gaming, in his demeanor and everything about him. Um, and so that was very surprising to see that, that, that was caused by the death of his, well, that was at least one of the big things was it was caused by the death of his mother. And many people mentioned that, that knew him really closely. It wasn't just one person. I heard that from a few different people that that was a huge turning point for him. And that things changed for Gary. And that's actually when Gary became a little bit of a different person for a while. So that was item one. And that was that had a hard – because, again, I'm trying to get in this guy's head to a certain extent. So that was kind of hard to, to figure out how – what's going on with him and kind of right through that. And then late in his life, everyone starts dying around him. Um, Gary had dealt with a lot of untimely death. Uh, you know – the expression untimely death, by the way, does anyone have a timely death? I, I don't know. Everyone says, oh, it's untimely death. Well, everyone's death is untimely, I think. But but he did. He really did have um, the way. The reason I use that term is because he had people die very early in his life, whether his father died when he was 17 or whether his original business partner, Don Kay, died at 36 of a heart attack. Um, and that was a very important thing because it actually shifted the power of TSR in a way that I won't get into today. But a uh, very important uh, death in Gary's life. That was his best friend and his business partner. Um, another one of his early, his his best friends died, and you know, at, when he was uh, at like 21 years old. You know, he had a lot of these, you know, deaths in his life. So late in his life, all of a sudden, you start seeing guys that start dying all around him, also. Um, and and that's where it, it it just it gets very sad. And Gary starts having um, uh, issues of his own. He starts having these strokes and all these health problems. And so you start to see that Gary really starts coming grip, to grips with his own mortality. And, and that was very hard to come to grips with as, as a writer, again, really trying to be as close to Gary as I could be to try to sort through the, the different things going through his mind. Also re realizing that he's also come back to religion it was a big source of strength for him, but also coming to grips with the fact the guy was breaking down. His body was breaking down, his lifestyle his, his 40 years of smoking and all the other things or whatever it was, probably close to 50 years of smoking, um, it was all 
it was all kind of crashing in on him. And he, now, now he starts watching his friends die. He starts going to these reunions put together by old TSR staffers of every year of someone that's that's died recently. And too young, by the way. A lot of these guys were not old. I mean, they were 60. They were in their 50s. Um, so I think that was a hard thing to really start getting used to. Um, but I also would say that through all of that, um, Gary, in a way, was at peace with where he was. Um, I think he was very comfortable with the fact by the end of his life that he had done some pretty great things. I think he had started to understand what his contribution to pop culture had meant. And that was fairly recent phenomenon. I think Gary was kind of out of, out of um, the public eye kind of through the 90s up until he comes back on Futurama as a character. Uh, because, of course, the creator of Futurama was really a big Gary Gygax fan because he played D&D. Um, by the 2000s, people started to make the, connect the dots about how important his contribution had been to video games, to all of these other things that started to pop up that, that had their roots in, in role playing. So, um, yeah, that, that was that was hard and it was um, enlightening, I think, in a lot of ways. Right, anyway, folks, uh, thanks again, Mike, for taking the time to tell us about Empire of Imagination, Gary Gygax and the birth of Dungeons and Dragons. Now, if somebody wants to get a copy of this, what's the best way? Is they just go to Amazon or do you have a website or what, what's the best way for the... Uh, you know, so all of the above, yeah, you can certainly find it on Amazon, uh, barnesandnobles.com, all of the major sites. It's also uh, in all the major bookstores, uh, you know, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, you name it, uh, will carry uh, Empire of Imagination, uh, probably in paperback these days, just came out in paperback, so that's, uh, that's another good way to find it. Um, you can find me at empireofimagination.com, that's my website, uh, on Twitter at, at mikewitwer.com, Mike, M-I-K-E, um, and uh, yeah, again, so it's, it's readily available now in paperback or hardcover, whatever you're, you're choosing. And I also want to give a plug to another book, a very fine book by a friend of mine, a fellow named Matt Barton, who wrote a book <laughs> called Dungeons and Desktops. And the reason I mentioned this, Mr. Barton, is I told you I was a fan of yours, and that this, I've got no less than two dozen notes and notations. Well, you can't see them here, but... But you have to take my word for it that I, I read your book thoroughly and made many, many notes uh, and got a lot of really great information out of your very fine work about this history. So I highly recommend this book. Well, thanks, Mike, for that. Thank you. I, I think I got you beat, though. I have two copies of your book, and they're, this is true. they're both signed. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mike, thanks again. This has been really fun. Hopefully Thank you'll you. write more than more than you have more books in the in the pipes or what are you going to just uh, rest on your laurels for a while? What's the plan? Uh, I've got no laurels to rest on. That's the problem. Uh, no, I um, you know, I do have another uh, book in mind, Matt. Um, I'm actually working on something. Hopefully that will will work out. Um, that has to do with um, uh, early uh, Walt Disney and Disneyland stuff. Actually, it's a total departure from what I'm working on now, but, but again, it's another, um, kind of look at a, an important person in the world of imagination. Okay, and, Walt Disney. Uh, yeah. Walt Disney. And it won't oh, be a biography. Right. Incidentally, it, it, it'll actually be kind of focused on, on Disneyland specifically. I'm very interested oh, in, yeah, in how that all came scary. about. Um, so I'm working on something as we speak about that right now, but it's, it's not fully gelled yet. And, um, so more to come, but that's the current project that's, that's got my attention. Oh, that's already piqued my interest. What was that quotation he's supposed to have said it, I forget he was walking with somebody, and uh, they said, "How can you do this, Walt? You've created this fantasy world, and uh, people, uh, you know, you know the quotation I'm talking about." Well, I'm, I'm trying because he's he's got so many good sound bites. It's, it's hard. Something I... like, uh, "How can you do? How can you have this world of fantasy here?" And he, his reply was something like, "Well, actually, this is the reality. You know, the stuff happening outside, the war, and the you know un injustice and all that. That's the fantasy." I, I mean, I thought that was a such an epic quotation. I've totally butchered it. <laughs> no, no, I mean, but no, he, he's got the, the truth is he's got a, he he has so many good sound bites. He was just such a futurist and and um, but also a nostalgist. Like he's such an interesting fella um, on so many levels. And then again, for me, the culmination of his biggest dream was kind of Disneyland. And and again, there's some parts of that that I think really need to be fleshed out in book form. There's a lot of books in that space, as you can imagine. But I want to do something really interesting with it, uh, probably more of a narrative nonfiction uh, approach. Um, so I, I'm excited about doing something in that. But he's an amazing guy, not unlike Gary in his own way, creating yeah, his empire. There's some imagine. overlap. I can, see, I can see the transition there. And there is. In, in a weird sort of way, there's a connection to me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's a connection there. 
in, like they're these are influence they're luminaries they're luminaries and that's all for this week's episode hope you guys enjoyed that really uh, had a great time with uh, talking to, to mike hope you enjoyed these chats uh, also have a Google Air Hangout that we recorded with him. If you would, uh, didn't see that already, would like some uh, more Mike Whitwer. He's also joined there by his brother Sam, who's an actor uh, that was on Battlestar Galactica, amongst uh, other things. So definitely go check that out. Uh, and as always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your support of this show. You're keeping these episodes coming. You're keeping Matt Chat alive, all for only a buck a week. So if you already stepped up to support the show, thank you very much. If you're still thinking about it, <laughs> I just go over there, dudes. It only takes a couple seconds. Uh, if you don't want to do the uh, Patreon thing, that's fine. Uh, you can also support the show via PayPal. And uh, the the uh, good old games uh, affiliate thing is kind of in limbo right now. I've got some paperwork to fill out, but as soon as I get that updated, I'll <laughs> continue to offer that service as well. Ooh. Uh, let's see what else was it I want to mention. Oh. If I seem a little scatterbrained, it's probably because at the same time I'm doing this, I'm also making videos for my online uh, video games course, a little summer course I'm offering here at St. Cloud State called Video Games as Literature. So I'm making videos for that as well as this, and it's kind of gotten me uh, pretty much ex exasperated uh, at the moment. If you, if you want to look at that course, uh, let me know. I can always let you, uh, I can always give you the link to those videos, but just keep in mind that for an academic uh, audience, mainly students, so it's not going to be the same style as Matt Chat, but, you know, happy to share if, if you're interested. Anyway, with that caveat. Okay, let's see. Uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Let's see, what do we have for news? A couple items here from good old Stig. Uh, he wrote in about this game called Saint Kotar. Go to uh, www.saintkotar.com. Uh, this is a psychological horror point and click adventure game coming in 2017. It's 2D. Uh, it's going to be available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. It merges a psychological horror narrative and classically inspired point and click mechanics with switchable characters. Uh, digitally hand painted with a distinctive 2D art style and an original eerie soundtrack. So they say they're inspired by uh, the Broken Sword series and the Monkey Island games, along with the uh, HP Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe. Now, I don't see how you can go wrong with that combination of influences, so definitely go check that out. Uh, we also have a game here called Fox in Forests, and this is, uh, I guess this was announced a while back with their reveal trailer, is what's new about this uh, item. Uh, this is a 2D action platformer, also for PC, Linux, Mac, and some consoles. Has adventure and puzzle game elements, inspired by the glorious days of 16-bit. Uh, so think Amiga, SNES, uh, Sega Genesis. Uh, the let's see, what are the, how do they describe this? Shoot slash uh, shoot slash switch and snatch. <laughs> shoot slash switch and snatch. <laughs> Try saying that uh, three times fast. A thrilling fla uh, fable with charming pixel art, super secrets, clever puzzles, screen-filling bosses, tricky challenges, and thriving <laughs> exploration. Uh, just check out the uh, trailer. I think you'll be impressed with this. Uh, I'm not sure when that's going to come out, but I thought you guys would like to know about it. All right, and then a third news item, uh, Bioshock is getting some HD remakes. Uh, this is the first three games uh, with a new single-player DLC, apparently. It's gonna, you're going to have director's commentary, uh, from Ken uh, Levine and Sean Robertson, and there's going to be some added uh, additional. There's going to be some additional content here. So they say, for example, players will have the option to walk around a virtual museum of concepts that, that never made it into the original game and tackle a variety of puzzles in different challenge rooms. Uh, so not quite clear on what's going to be available for PC and what will be console only. Uh, it seems like. Uh, there's some stuff just coming out for the PS4 and the Xbox One, uh, but they say the remastered Bioshock 1 and 2 will be available for Windows PC. So uh, if you're a Bioshock fan, uh, good news for you. you know, I should probably do a, uh, a match chat on the original, original game. All right, so the last item here is for all of you Shmup fans. This is uh, Hyper Sentinel. 
Uh, this is a uh, retro gaming inspired shoot 'em up presented by Andrew Hewson, founder of the Hewson Consultants, which is probably a name you're familiar with if you like shmups. Uh, they did Uridium, Paradroid, Nebulous, <laughs> Zynapse, Cybernoid, Quasitron, Stormlord, ooh, and Eliminator. Love the uh, soundtrack on Eliminator. One of my favorite uh, chip tunes of all time. Let's see, 21st Century Entertainment. Oh, so they also uh, got some connections to Pinball Dreams and Pinball Fantasies. What? Wow, you know, this is definitely one to keep an eye on. Uh, so they're calling uh, Hyper Sentinel a love letter to old school arcade action and the computer shoot 'em ups of the 80s with a unique style of fast-paced, skillful blasting. So they're trying to uh, raise 47,000, and they're, last time I checked, they were up to 7,000, but they still have a month to go. So uh, that's definitely one that you should pitch in if you want to see this game get made. Uh, hopefully they won't lose heart <laughs> and uh, pull up before I even get this announcement out. All right, whew, a lot of news. All right, what about that hail of the week? Uh, this week I'm uh, got one. <laughs> I don't know if I can say this with a straight face. It's called Kickapoo Joy Juice. <laughs> Couldn't do it. Uh, from the makers of X Lax. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, this is a citrus flavored carbonated drink made with real sugar, and apparently this is some some vintage beverage. Let's see, bottled under the authority of the Monarch Beverage Company out of Atlanta, Georgia. Let's see, Kickapoo, <laughs> Kickapoo Joy Juice, a magical concoction first enjoyed in Al Cap's Little Abner. Interesting connection there. Uh, leaves people all over the world happy and craving for more since 1934. So swig some swag and get the most out of today. Do what you love, love what you do. Well, that's a pretty good catchphrase. Uh, and I definitely never had a Kickapoo before, so let's get this Kickapoo <laughs> Joy Juice open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Kickapoo Joy Juice here in the rather, uh, rather excellent drinking horn. Trying to get this done. There's a huge lightning thunderstorm outside. Hope it doesn't shut me down before I get done filming here. Anyway, uh, this, this uh, Kickapoo, I was expecting it to smell like a uh, 7-Up or a Mountain Dew, something like that, but you, while you can smell the uh, sort of lemon-lime citrusy aroma, there's also kind of a pine uh, aroma there that you wouldn't smell in those other, uh, other drinks. Actually, I uh, prefer this. I like that uh, combination. Right, let's give it a taste, though. Yes, this is uh, definitely a, a good flavor on this. It's uh, very sweet, but not too sweet. Uh, you get a lot of uh, kind of a lemonade meets, uh, oh, I don't know, some kind of pine tea, if you've had that, uh, with a little bit of an orange flavor there towards the end. Uh, it's, a, it's a really good combination. Let me try it again here. You know, i got to say, I really like this. It's, uh, there's a lot of uh, different flavors that hit you all at once. It's kind of hard to explain it all. Uh, but you get a lot of citrus, a little bit of a pine, uh, a little bit of an orange. It's kind of like lemonade with a little bit of orange juice uh, with a hint of uh, some kind of <laughs> pine resin. And believe it or not, it all works together really well. Uh, let's try this one more time. I mean, I don't know who wouldn't like this. If you like Sprite, Mountain Dew, uh, those kind of drinks, you ought to give this a try. You might actually prefer this. Uh, Kickapoo Joy Juice. Uh, I gotta say, as uh, citrusy drinks go, this is probably one of my favorites I've had so far. So I'm gonna go a full five out of five drinking horns on this. Uh, really, really good flavor, good aroma on it. Uh, it's nice and complex, sophisticated for a soda. So five out of five, uh, no problem. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. Uh, now the uh, quotation that I want to read to you is the one I was trying to tell Mike in that video, and I, I kind of butchered it there, so I wanted to get it right for this segment. And let me give you the context here. So it's Walt Disney giving the uh, evangelist Billy Graham a tour of Disneyland. And uh, Billy Graham apparently says something like, uh, this is a nice fantasy, uh, but you know, he's kind of being dismissive, I guess. And uh, Disney had a pretty cool response to this. It goes something like this. You know, the fantasy isn't here. This is very real. The park is reality. The people are natural here. They're having a good time. They're communicating. This is what people really are. The fantasy is out there. 
outside the gates of Disneyland, where people have hatreds and people have prejudices. It's not really real. <laughs> See you guys next week. Don't be afraid. We're right behind you. Yes, right behind you.